At the start of the 1960s, the Soviet Union was the world's second largest oil producer, trailing only the United States. By itself, the Soviet Union nearly matched oil production from the entire Middle East. Many European countries depended on Soviet oil, and the Communist Party used that to their advantage. In this video, we will look at the beginnings and rise of the titanic Soviet oil apparatus, from its start with the Russian Empire in the late 1880s to its ascendancy after World War II. But first, a sponsor read for the Asianometry newsletter. Check out the newsletter for full scripts of previously released videos and additional commentary after their release. I think there are over 11,000 signups right now, which is pretty cool. The sign-up link is in the video description below. I try to put one out every week, maybe two. All right, back to the show. In the late 1820s, the Russian Empire annexed a small city called Baku from the Iranians. There was oil there, and throughout the 1800s, Baku rose to become one of the world's leading oil production sites. At its peak in the 1880s, oil production in Baku reached a third of America's. By 1914, 90% of Russia's oil production came out of Baku. The Tsar owned all the oil fields, and his government generated a quarter of all its revenues through indirect taxes on oil production. But the fields themselves were tended to by over 20 private companies. The biggest of these private companies was Nobel Brothers, or Brand Nobel. Yes, Nobel of the Nobel Prize. The four Nobel Brothers, Emil, Ludwig, Robert, and Alfred, were foreign pioneers in Baku's oil industries. The Nobels had long ties to the Russian Empire as arms dealers. In 1873, Ludwig Nobel gave his brother 25,000 rubles so that he may go to Russia and procure some Russian walnut wood. Instead, Robert used the money to buy an oil refinery and built up a small company. Seeing the vast opportunities, he brought his brother Ludwig into the deal, and together they established a Nobel Brothers oil production company. At the height of its 38-year history in Baku, Nobel Brothers was one of the biggest oil companies in the world. Russia's modern oil industry traces back to the systems and practices set up by the Nobels. With the Tsar's backing, Nobel Brothers introduced oil pipelines and tankers to transport oil more economically than ever before. Many of these were implemented over the objections of local communities. As the major shareholder Ludwig Nobel built the richest fortunes of all the Nobel Brothers, for his part, Alfred did not participate in the company's operations, though he did lend his technical advice and owned a significant share. Baku's thriving private oil industry came in part due to a more corporate-friendly shift in Russian czarist policy, and industrialists thought they could eventually export their millions of barrels of production and challenge the global standard oil monopoly. However, a lack of funds and division between the bureaucrats and the businessmen caused the opportunity to pass by the Baku oil industry began to stagnate. Overall oil production declined from a peak of 11.5 million metric tons in 1901 to 9.4 million metric tons 15 years later in 1916. After 1904, Russia never managed to export more than a million tons of that production. And then came the Bolsheviks. In 1919, Shell, used to be Royal Dutch Shell, but they changed in 2022, and the other big British oil companies attempted to organize an annexation of the Russian Empire's oil regions as that empire collapsed. But the British government refused to back them with an armed intervention in the Caucasus, and thus the Western oil companies suffered massive financial losses when the Soviets took over and nationalized all their assets. Shell, for their part, lost about 171.4 million rubles of British capital, the French and Germans lost millions in investments as well. It took a long time for Shell to deal with this new situation. As late as 1925, they still expected the imminent collapse of the Soviet state, a prediction made over 60 years too early. During the Russian Civil War that followed the Tsar's collapse, the non-Russian ethnic peoples of Baku attempted to establish their own country, the Azerbaijan Democratic Republic. But Lenin and the Bolsheviks desperately needed the city's oil to power its armies and the industry. So in December 1920, they sent the Red Army to the Caucasus and reconquered the area. They recaptured a wasteland. Between the fields' natural decline and the wars, production was just the third of their pre-war numbers. So in 1921, with the Soviet economy in shambles, Lenin led a reversal from central planning policies, the new economic policy. 
One of the most controversial parts of this policy was the potential resumption of concessions to foreign capitalists to exploit natural resources. The Bolsheviks had worked so hard to eject the Russian capitalists, why are they now inviting the foreign capitalists back in? Debate raged within the Politburo. Alexei Rykov, chairman of the Supreme Council of the National Economy, argued that foreign help was unnecessary. Mikhail Tomsky, a union trade leader, thought that the foreign capitalists would turn Soviet workers against their young country. And Joseph Stalin, then Commissar of Nationalities dealing with non-Russian ethnicities, felt that those workers would not support this new policy. Nevertheless, Lenin himself advocated for this policy and so won the vote 8-6 to six in February 1921. He argued at a party congress later in March 1921, Without concessions, we cannot hope to receive the benefits of advanced modern capitalist technology. And without that technology, we cannot build the foundations for our large-scale industry in sectors such as the extraction of petroleum, which is of such extraordinary importance for the entire world economy. Lenin was as anti-capitalist as they come, but he also exhibited a pragmatic streak whenever needed. Even so, he also asked the members not to make any written record of their discussions of this matter. By now, reports from Baku to Moscow had started to come in. They told of broken transportation links, supply shortages, and salt water intrusions into the oil fields. Salt water being an oil field pollutant that damages the well's production. In April 1921, workers in Baku struck in order to protest chronic shortages and miserable working conditions. That particular strike was quote-unquote liquidated, according to contemporary reports. But nevertheless, people on the ground recommended that the Soviets engage one of the global oil syndicates as soon as possible. The oil industry was thus a critical early opportunity for engagement between the Soviets and the rest of the world. After World War I, oil companies in both Europe and America scrambled to secure supplies across the globe. For the American oil giants, cheap Soviet oil was a chance to leapfrog their European rivals in the world markets. After nationalization, Nobel Brothers shrewdly sold half of their Russian oil assets for about $7 to $9 million to Standard Oil of New Jersey, the forerunner of today's ExxonMobil. Standard was apparently making a calculated bet that the Soviet Union would collapse and Nobel would reclaim their assets. Anxious to protect their claim, Standard joined Shell and the Anglo-Persian Oil Company in negotiations for vast concession tracks in Baku and Grozny, the capital of Chechnya. A deal almost came through in which Standard and Anglo-Persian would control half of Grozny and build a pipeline to the Black Sea. But Standard eventually passed under pressure from the Warren G. Harding administration in the United States. Companies stumbled over each other to grab a piece, but in the end, the vast foreign concessions deal Lenin pushed for never materialized. For instance, in 1923, the Sinclair Oil Corporation offered the Soviet government a $250 million loan for a near-complete 25-year monopoly on the richest oil-bearing areas of Grozny. The Soviets turned that one down, but granted Sinclair a concession to Sakhalin Island. Great, except the Japanese did not allow Sinclair to drill there. The oil company was later implicated in the Teapot Dome scandal and that consumed their attention. They pulled out. International Barnsdall Corporation, a small American company, was given permission to scope out undeveloped lands. Barnsdall attempted to get drilling, but eventually pulled out in 1924 for undisclosed reasons. And that was all. At the time, the United States government saw the Soviet regime as illegitimate and discouraged its citizens from trading with them. Makes sense. After all, the Soviets repudiated the Russian Empire's debt, nationalized American private property, and advocated for the overthrow of the American government. Engagement meant some form of recognition, and the Americans did not want to condone the laundering of nationalized private assets. That, combined with Lenin's illnesses, closed this curious window in history for bringing foreign capitalism back into the Soviet Union. As it turned out, this was not a significant loss, because at the same time, the Soviets were starting to drill again on their own. Production surged from 4.2 million metric tons of oil in 1921 to 6.3 million in 1924. This would not be possible without British equipment. 
Like Shell, Vickers, the British weapons and engineering firm, had also suffered mighty losses during the Soviet nationalization. Something north of two million pounds of their assets were taken. But unlike Shell, they opted to make the most of their lemons. In 1922, the Soviets announced the National Electrification Plan, Goelro. Lenin had personal affections for electrification, so Vickers reached out to the Soviets and began selling them turbines. Then in 1924, they demonstrated their modern oil drilling equipment to a Soviet delegation visiting the United Kingdom. The Soviets were extremely impressed and decided to deploy them to their big oil fields in Baku and Grozny. How did the Soviets pay for this? Historically, the Russian Empire exported grain for such things. However, difficult relations between the Bolsheviks and the peasantry at the time, leading to the Scissors Crisis, made this impractical. So, they turned to oil. Over the next two years, Vickers delivered millions of pounds worth of oil equipment to the Soviets. In exchange, the Soviets gave Vickers a percentage of their foreign oil sales. By 1926, oil was one of the country's few profitable export sectors. The Soviets paid Vickers a handsome sum, single-handedly keeping afloat their then-struggling oil equipment business. Despite oil turning into one of their most profitable exports, for the longest time, the Soviets never really considered using it for themselves. Even as the rest of the world switched to using oil, the Soviets focused on hydropower, electrification, and coal. It was a curious attitude. It was not like the country didn't need it. Energy consumption in the Soviet Union was growing over 13% a year throughout the 1920s and 30s. The country's domestic needs for gasoline, going just by the Red Army's ongoing mechanization efforts alone, were growing just as quickly, reaching 3 million tons a year in 1940. Furthermore, in the 1920s, several Soviet geologists, like the legendary Ivan Gubkin, insisted that large oil deposits existed in the Volga Ural Basin. Yet despite a few oil wells having already been drilled there, the Soviets declined to invest considerable resources to fully exploit it. This is largely because the Soviets believed that the world only had a finite amount of oil under the ground. Thusly, oil was seen as too expensive and rare to compete with alternatives like coal. They spent considerable resources investigating coal liquefaction, turning coal into oil or petrochemicals, seeing it as more sustainable than oil. So on the eve of World War II, the Soviet oil industry was in the dregs, stagnant and underfunded. The Nazi German invasion in June 1941 Operation Barbarossa would change that. The German mobile army needed gasoline to fuel its war machine. Aircraft, cars, trucks, and trains, all of these ran on oil. But unfortunately, the Germans lacked a reliable supply of it. There were a few fields in the northwest, Wrightbrook for instance, but most of that oil was largely unsuitable to fuel planes, trains, and automobiles. On the eve of Operation Barbarossa, most of the Germans' 56 million barrels of oil reserves were sourced from Romania, somewhat unexpectedly one of the world's leading oil technology companies at the time, and the Soviet Union. The rest came from their own coal liquefaction industry. Without sufficient fuel, the Luftwaffe cannot operate to its full strategic capability, relegated mostly to providing tactical air support. Thusly, in 1942, after their attempted capture of Moscow was thwarted, the Germans devised a plan called Case Blue. Here they sought to capture the oil-rich cities of the Caucasus, including Baku and Grozny. Nazi Germany's leader believed that these natural resources would have alleviated the country's hunger for oil. He wasn't wrong, but he missed a lot of smaller details. For instance, nobody seemed to have figured out how exactly to get the oil back to Germany without first tangling with the Soviet Black Sea Fleet, which held naval superiority at the time. But they never got to that bridge anyway. Logistical issues and the winter halted German forces far short of the oil fields that were their goals. Aware of this, the Luftwaffe was ordered to bomb the fields in an attempt to disable the Soviet oil industry. Such a thing would have been strategically devastating to the Soviets, but they were too far away to seriously damage Baku. And then, the German leader fatefully directed the 6th Army to invade and seize the city of Stalingrad. The rest is history. 
Expecting the Germans to arrive at Baku at any moment, the Red Army hurriedly began evacuating personnel and machinery out of the city. Drilling equipment, unattached pipelines, and even entire refineries were disassembled and brought to the Volga Ural area, which started to get the name of the second Baku. C can I get a video on the logistics of evacuating Baku here? For this reason, the oil industries of the Caucasus saw their oil production numbers devastated. Oil production dropped to levels not seen since the 1920s, over a 50% decline in a single year. Azerbaijani historians look sourly back at this time. Oil production rates didn't return to 1941 levels until after the Soviet Union dissolved. But I feel like the Soviets did what they could considering the circumstances. For their part, the Allies considered bombing the fields themselves had the Germans succeeded in capturing them. Meanwhile, the Soviets scrambled to ramp up oil production in the Volga Ural oil fields. However, those crude oils were particularly high in sulfur, which Soviet oilmen struggled with. They often resorted to mixing Baku and Volga Ural oils together to make it more palatable. The Americans helped, disassembling and sending six of their own refineries to the area. Stalin, for his part, threw everything he could into production, calling petroleum the soul of military equipment and hailing oilmen as warriors at the oil front. But the Soviets needed time and technologies that they did not have. Oil production in the Volga Urals never ramped up enough during the war in order to replace the production that was lost at Baku. The war taught the Soviets the importance of oil and petroleum, and after it ended, they sought to control as much of it as they possibly could. The Soviet occupied territories reflected this strategic goal. They occupied Romania and temporarily took control of Austria's oil industry. The Soviet Union would depend on imported oil from these two countries until the mid-1950s. To revitalize production, the Red Army confiscated oil technologies, much of it originally sourced from the West, and sent it back home as war booty. There was a particularly high demand for pipes. Throughout the 1950s, the Soviets invested an increasingly great deal of resources into developing the oil fields of the Volga Ural Basin. Baku was no longer the priority, with production rates there suffering because of it. But the bet paid off. By the end of the 1950s, fields like the massive Rumashkino oil field, 4,200 square kilometers, or six times the size of Singapore, were producing more oil than the rest of the country's regions combined. The Volga Urals Basin remains a significant oil production area to this day, yet its massive oil wealth was only just a taste of what would soon come. From almost the very beginning, the Soviet Union tapped its vast natural resources to survive and grow. Oil and gas helped Lenin industrialize the country and fueled the Red Army's victory over Germany. As production expanded over the years, the Soviets began exporting energy to certain countries. At first, this was to earn foreign currency to buy goods like wheat, meat, or advanced technology. But over time, the Soviets started using energy exports to flex their political muscles. It became leverage for keeping their satellites and allies in line. Such a tributary arrangement would contribute to the Soviet Union's ultimate downfall. But let's save that story for another video in another time. Alright everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up to the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.